Welcome to History Behind the Headlines, Presidential Records Act. I'm Jim Grossman, Executive Director of the American Historical Association, the largest professional organization serving historians in all fields, in all sorts of workplaces and professions. The AHA promotes history education, the professional work of historians, and the essential role of historical thinking in public life, which is what this conversation is all about. If at any time during the conversation today, you find yourself seized with the urge to join the AHA, please hold that thought until you get an email message afterwards. You'll get a link after the program to join. We can't do any of this work or the other things we do on behalf of history and the work of historians without the support of members. We also invite you to consider joining the Society of American Archivists, our collaborators in organizing this event, and our reliable partners in the National Coalition for History. The SAA and its members represent a profession closely tied to the work of the AHA's members. We can't do our work without them. This program is part of the AHA's History Behind the Headlines, series, which features historians providing historical context for current events, suggesting how historical thinking can provide different angles on the world around us. History Behind the Headlines is generally sponsored, uh, generously sponsored by AHA member Jared Brubaker, uh, whom I, to whom I am very grateful uh, for his help with this. Today's discussion, which will run until 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, brings together four leading scholars to place the current controversies and questions around presidential records in historical context. And obviously, uh, we have timed this very well. Uh, however, I have to say, I cannot say that we had any kind of uh, internal uh, informed uh, notice about what is currently going on. Uh, we just guessed right. Our discussion will be moderated by my friend and colleague, Peniel Joseph, Associate Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Professor of Public Affairs, Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values, Founding Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the University of Texas at Austin, and of course, most important, President of the Pacific Coast Branch of the American Historical <laughs> Association. My friend and colleague, Jacqueline Price Asafo, Executive Director of the Society of American Archivists, will offer remarks at the conclusion of today's event. I'm going to turn this over to Peniel and turn off my camera and spend the rest of the next uh, hour just listening. Thank you for attending. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, it's my esteemed pleasure to introduce uh, these three colleagues, uh, Nicole Hemmer, uh, Tim Neftali and Trudy Huskamp Peterson, uh, who are going to be our, our panelists today. Um, Nicole Hemmer is the director of the Rogers Center for the American Presidency and associate professor of history at Vanderbilt University. A scholar of conservatism, media, and the presidency, she is the author of Partisans, the Conservative Revolutionaries Who Remade American Politics in the 1990s, and Messenger of the Right, Conservative Media and Transformation of American Politics. She is co-host of the podcast Past and Present and This Day in Esoteric Political History and co-founder of Made by History at the Washington Post. Tim Neftali is a clinical associate professor of history and public service, as well as the director of the undergraduate public policy program at New York University and founding director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. And you may recognize him from CNN as a presidential historian and scholar. Trudy Huskamp Peterson is an archival consultant and certified archivist. She spent 24 years with the US National Archives, including more than two years as acting archivist of the United States. She was also the founding executive director of the Open Society Archives in Budapest, Hungary, and the director of archives and record management for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. She is a past president of the International Conference of the Roundtable on Archives, and the Society of American Archivists and chaired the International Council on Archives' Human Rights Working Group and the Working Group on a Standard for Access to Archives. Among her publications are Final Acts, 
a guide to preserving the records of truth commissions and temporary courts, permanent records. All right, and I would be remiss without noting that today, April 4th, uh, 2023, is the 55th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so there, there's a, this is a hugely historic day. Certainly, as we are um, convening this conversation, uh, former President Donald Trump is, is facing indictment in New York City. Um, uh, but we're here really to talk about um, the Presidential Records Act and really the fact that these records of late have been in the media uh, with uh, President Biden, former President Trump, former Vice President Mike Pence, documents that are classified that should have been turned over to the National Archives um, suddenly have been found in their possession or in their summer homes. And that's really um, caused a lot of controversy. Uh, so I want to start with, with uh, Nicole, Nikki. Um, what is the Presidential Records Act? I think this is sort of a bit of esoteria that most of the American public doesn't even know there's such a thing. So what is it and why is it important? So the Presidential Records Act is one of those pieces of legislation that came in the aftermath in the 1970s of Watergate and the church committee hearings, which exposed all of this wrongdoing by the CIA and the intelligence communities. And in the, in the wake of all of this revelation of wrongdoing by public officials, there was an effort to preserve records um, that in the case of the Nixon administration, they have tried to destroy, um, to throw some sunlight on um, what was happening within the federal government and to make it possible um, under things like FOIA for Americans to access some of the documents that had been created by the federal government. And so the Presidential Records Act is part of that big push to open up the government in a lot of ways. I think people might be surprised to learn, first of all, that there, there wasn't necessarily an official preservation of records law until the 1950s, um, that the idea of preserving all of the records of the federal government, of different agencies and cabinets was relatively late in the game. And when it came to presidential papers, presidential papers were considered the private property of the president. Um, so it wasn't considered to be part of the public record at all until the passage of the Presidential Records Act. Um, and that's a pretty important shift because it recognizes that the work done by the president isn't private property. It isn't kind of an internal discussion that the president has with himself, but that those are public records. Those are things that the American people deserve to see, not just because they might be evidence of crimes and wrongdoing, although that's gonna come up a lot today, um, but because it is part of our nation's history, right? It's part of how decisions get made. It's, it's part of the record of how politics runs and in a democracy that should be part of the public record. Um, so you get the Presidential Records Act in 1978, it goes into effect in 1981 and pretty much immediately presidents are trying to figure out ways to limit it um, and because they understand that if their papers become public, in some ways they lose control of their legacy. Um, and the presidents from Reagan on were very concerned with their legacy. Um, you even get after the, um, the beginning, uh, after the September 11th attacks, um, George W. Bush putting more restraints on the Presidential Records Act. Essentially, he, he puts forward an executive order that essentially says, you know what, these are off limits in perpetuity unless the president says, okay, you can look at them. Um, and so there has been this real push and pull, not only with accessing presidential records, but in some cases with making sure they never enter the record to begin with. I mean, this is something that we saw um, with other administrations as well, especially with the rise of like, telephone calls and finding ways around creating a written record. But at the beginning of the Trump administration, people might remember that they um, were using a system called Confide, where they could send messages to one another that would automatically self-destruct so that there would be no record created in the first place. Um, or that story in Politico from early in the Trump presidency that talked about how after meetings, Donald Trump would rip up all of the records and then there were two people who were hired to tape them back together, um, two people who were, were ultimately fired. And so even though we have this Presidential Records Act, actually 
creating those records, getting those records, and then also getting those records past the wall of um, classification mm -hmm. is, um, is a challenge for making sure that as many of these records are publicly available as possible. Great, thank you. Um, Tim, why should this, you know, Nicole just gave us a great historical context for all of this. Why should it matter to the public? You know, we keep hearing um, perspectives on uh, Mike Pence, on uh, Joe Biden, on Trump. What is the public interest uh, in, in both the Presidential Records Act, but the fact that we're finding these classified documents sort of strewn all over the place? One of the, thank you, Peniel, one, one of the constants in our political culture is um, Americans tend to be concerned about excessive power. And Americans are, uh, Americans tend to like the div division of power. The div and and the Presidential Records Act is actually a check on presidential power. Um, as Nikki has explained, presidents understand that and they are looking for ways to to, to, to lessen the power, but it exists. And why is it a check on presidential power? Uh, again, uh, riffing off of Nikki, uh, presidents are interested in legacy. Uh, that's something I learned, uh, I knew it in advance, but when you become the head of a presidential library, uh, you, very, you very quickly encounter people who are consumed by the question of the legacy of the president whose name is over the, the front door. So why do these, uh, why does the Records Act matter? Well, because accountability depends on evidence and the documents, the materials, because we're in a digital age now, so we're not just talking about documents, the, that's evidence of good things and bad things. And one of the checks on a president is the knowledge that if they do something wrong, somebody will find out. Now, they may not find out while the president is in office because presidents can control access to that material while they're in office. But once they leave office, eventually, and we can talk later about the deficiencies in our declassification system, but eventually that material is going to see the light of day. And, and that will matter even if the president himself, someday herself, is no longer alive their family will be alive and their family is deeply invested in that legacy. So the Presidential Records Act is a source of accountability. And even though, as, as Peniel said, it's a very esoteric law, it has profound consequences, um, particularly in an era of an imperial presidency where the president has, as the most powerful person in the world, arguably, the president, um, has the ability to change lives and can, I'm sure, become besotted with this power. And the knowledge that somebody, many people, will figure out how they misuse that power. Let's leave aside the question of crimes. Abuse of power is just as bad. I think that is a potential check. And so I believe that the health of this act is something that Americans who care about power, and I believe every American does, should care about. So even though it's esoteric, I am delighted by the fact that um, mistakes by Vice President Pence and former Vice President, current President Biden, and whatever it is that Donald Trump did, we may see an indictment soon, and whatever his crimes are will be alleged, that that has actually shone the bright light of scrutiny on, on, a, on a check on presidential power that most Americans, unfortunately, to this moment, don't ever really think about. So that that's how I see the connection between accountability and the Presidential Records Act. Great, thank you, Tim. Trudy, in certain ways, the the, the buck stops with you in terms of the the archivist and the former archivist of the United States. You know, what what's the role of the archives here um, in these presidential records? preserving them for future historians and journalists um, to really get, like Tim was talking about, uh, a perspective on the good and the bad, or even the ambivalent that has occurred in an administration. So what's the role of archivists here? Because when we think, when we think about archive, archives, we don't usually think about archivists 
vis-a-vis -vis presidential records. We usually think about archives, uh, sort of public archives and open archives or people's individual archives, wealthy people like the Rockefellers or something. But, but the archivists of the United States and the National Archives are where these things are housed, at least since after 1981. So in addition to presidential libraries, what's the role of the archivist in the context of the Presidential Records Act? Well, let me answer that by adding a little bit to uh, Nikki's good um, discussion of how the act came to be, because you, un you start to understand the archives role when you understand where the archives was at that time. And starting in 1950, the National Archives was placed under something called the General Services Administration, which was a conglomerate agency, which did everything from um, motor pools to buying uh, paper cups for the government. It was an unhappy marriage, but it was a subordinate part. And it became a real problem when Nixon left office because Nixon's negotiation over his papers was with the head of the General Services Administration, not with the archivist of the United States. And some pretty ugly uh, decisions were made by those two men working together. And that's part of the background to the uh, Records Act as well. So when the uh, Congress decided it had to do something, it decided to create a presidential commission, or not a, president, a national commission, uh, called the Public Documents Commission, shorthand, which was to look at what had happened to the records of all three branches of government at the top. What happened to the records of the uh, justices of the Supreme Court? What happened to the records of the members of Congress? What happened to the records of the president? And a wonderful historian was the key staff member on that commission. And so it's a good report. Uh, Congress then chose only to look at the presidential part. They chose not to look at themselves and they chose not to look at the justices of the, the Supreme Court. But when they started then to write that legislation, they were looking at an archivist who was down in the bureaucracy a couple steps from the president, but was also an appointee of the president. And so the first step is, you know, can Congress really do this? Can they really legislate in this uh, realm? And if they did this, then how do you make a distinction between the president and his employee, which is supposed to have all this power? And so some of the really odd parts of the act are trying to buffer that relationship and make sure the archivist has enough authority um, to actually deal with this. And you see it in the uh, specific role where the president, the acting president says, I think we should destroy some of this stuff. And the archivist is required to give an opinion but can't overrule the president. And the only ones who can overrule the president is the Congress. And the only thing the archivist can do is say, hello, Senate, we think this is a bad idea. So it's a very complicated act because of the way it's embedded within the government. Because of that, then, uh, the administration of the act is not straightforward at all. Uh, you are dealing with a past president and you have to negotiate the relationship between the current president and the past president who are often of different parties. And you have to, if the past president says, I don't want this released, you have to ask the current president, will you enforce that? Here we get into presidential authorities all over again. Uh, and then negotiate how that is going to be worked. But it's, I, I wanna say one other thing. It's important to know that this is not about classified records. The press has picked up on that and has overdone it. Uh, the majority of presidential records are not security classified. They deal with things like uh, legislation and how are we going to craft this legislation? Or how are we going to respond to this legislative initiative we get? What are we thinking about on health? Uh, we've seen it 
of course, in Clinton on the his big effort to do uh, health legislation. And we've seen it, of course, in the COVID crisis. And all of that kind of record keeping, which is so important for understanding the history of how we got to where we are, is not classified. And to look at this as an issue of classified records only is simply a mistake. All right, that's a great segue into my question to Tim. You know, right now in the context of the Trump uh, indictment or or plans to indict, um, what about the resonance of this controversy in the Presidential Records Act now? Uh, the partisan divides over, you know, if if uh, if a Democratic president has some papers that are askew. Uh, Republicans are accusing that person of corruption, and really vice versa. If the Republican uh, president has some papers are, that are askew, Democrats and others are accusing um, that person of corruption, especially within the context of your earlier comments about how Americans are really um, careful and are worried about anybody having too much power and really like divided government. What are we to make where we're in 23? 2023 in a context where um, it, it, there is so much hyper-partisanship and, and, and really everything, even, even something that is sort of coming out of the good government post-Watergate movement of the 1970s. And like Trudy's reminding us, Congress didn't really spread the wealth uh, in, terms of, in terms of putting checks on its own records and putting checks on the Supreme Court record. Trudy, thank you for that history, because I think that that's what they should have done, right? I think, I think that that all three branches of, of like Tim is explained to us, that divided government, they all should have a check on their power where we can check the congressional records. I'd love to see what Mitch McConnell was up to during these <laughs> periods. And not, not just Mitch McConnell, um, Tip O'Neill too. I, I'm, I'm a bipartisan historian. I'd like to see what they were all up to, right? And so Tim, what, what are we to make of this during this this very pivotal moment in American democracy, where again, we've got January 6th, we've got um, Trump and the indictment, the big lie, so much is going on. What are we to make, what are we to make of this right now? Well, Peniel, if there's ever any question about why historians and archivists matter, I think you've just answered it. The devil is in the details. And um, in a, trying to explain the difference between the Pence and Biden cases, and I put them in the same category. Uh, um, Trudy will, will, will know in, in better detail, not because she was involved in those cases, but she, she knows that process, I'm sure very well, of how uh, presidencies end in the role of NARA, uh, the National Archives at the end of a presidency. I know of it only indirectly through uh, Nancy Smith, who, who was at the archives when, when I was a director, and she ran that process for a while. But um, I see Biden and the Biden and Pence cases as quite similar. The number of documents involved suggests that, that they are similar, that this is probably a mistake. Whereas in the case of former President Trump, we, we know that um, his counsel, his White House counsel, um, Pat Cipollone, uh, warned him that, the, that these boxes of materials in the residence had to be turned over to the National Archives before the Trump family left on the 20th of January, uh, 2021. And he ignored that. So it's not a matter of inadvertence or of a mistake. This is volition, this is will. So from the moment he takes the materials, uh, there's a problem. What makes it even worse is that then he was asked for the materials and then he begrudgingly had his people provide some of them, but not all of them. And then the FBI had to go and search his residence and discovered not only materials that belong to the American people, but materials that belong to the American people that happened to be classified, which then rose, raised another issue. As Trudy mentioned, the Presidential Records Act covers all presidential records of which only a small percentage, important percentage, I'd say for many of us, but small percentage is classified. So you had the issue of him taking something that didn't belong to him, him being asked nicely for it to be returned, him not returning it. In fact, his people saying they had returned it when it was a lie. And then it turns out that what he kept was highly classified. So it's a series of issues quite different from the Pence-Biden matter. Now, 
in our highly partisan environment, those details get washed away and it all is same old, same old. And all I can say is that as educators, we have an obligation to try our very best to try to show, to explain to our fellow Americans and the interested public mainly, the differences and why one, both of them are a problem, but one is a major threat to the Presidential Records Act and the other, while a, an issue, was quite inadvertent. So that, but it's very hard in a partisan era. I agree, but we have to keep trying. Now, the other point I wanted to make is to keep in mind the constitutional nature of this and Trudy raised it. Um, when Congress decided to make presidential records public records, they were taking property away from presidents. We might not think of it that way, but presidents did. Mm -hmm. Presidents didn't have, for a long time, they did not get um, salaries uh, as, as former presidents. What they would get is the right to write off their taxes, the value of their papers. Nixon would actually get into trouble with this because his lawyer, probably he, um, played around with a date and predated a document. Anyway, my point is simply that what Congress did, it was take property from another branch. So if you think of it that way, this is a constitutional issue. And so in return for taking property from the presidents, the president's representatives, which at that point I think were from the Carter administration, um, said, okay, you do that, then we have to have a role in controlling these documents, which is why Trudy explained that there are these layers of, 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 of authority, not just for current incumbent presidents, but for former presidents in the act. That's why it's so complicated because in a sense, Congress had to admit, yes, we actually we're taking something from the other branch. And the other branch said, well, if you're gonna take something from us, we're gonna need to control what happened. Now, what didn't happen and should have happened, Trudy perhaps remembers that debate, was that Congress decided, as she mentioned, that it would not subject itself to this. And one of the great outrages for those of us who care about how our government functions is the fact that the Congress of the United States is not subject to FOIA, right. which is the reason why Henry Kissinger, for example, put his documents at the Library of Congress, which is outside the purview of FOIA. So there is a, 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 I think, significant power struggle that lies behind the story of the Presidential Records Act and FOIA, which helps explain why we know a lot more about how presidents make decisions than we know about how Congress makes decisions. And much more than the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so Trudy, let me, you know, let's talk about what, what can the archives and the archivists do um, to sort of maintain that neutrality in this hyper-partisan era? Because in a way, for some partisans, just the very, the very notion that the Presidential Record Act compels presidents to turn over what Tim is saying, their property to the archives makes the archivist a partisan, especially when we're thinking about, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Trump or even, even you know, Biden, um, if, if people think that somehow those, those materials will sully that president's legacy um, in, in any kind of way. Because so many partisans, I, I work at the, the, the LBJ school, the public affairs, and, you know, <laughs> the, the folks there, you know, are obviously concerned about President Lyndon Johnson's legacy. And Tim is former director of the, the Nixon Library. And there were mm -hmm. folks there who are very much um, interested in Nixon's uh, 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 legacy. The Obama Library, when that's finally erected, there are people who are going to be very much interested in how history looks upon Barack Obama. So what can what can the archivists do, especially, you know, I'm really intrigued by the fact that, yeah, Congress, and this is a shame because you think about the 1970s and, and you know, Nicole, Tim, you, you know, do some such great work on this. That is the last era of good government that we had post Watergate, church committee, where we were really having this internal dialogue with ourselves and our institutions. And I have to say, probably before 2020 and the reckoning around George Floyd, the 1970s and post Watergate are the time where so many Americans find out about the FBI and counterintelligence mm -hmm. programs. And they really do do campaign finance reforms, things that Citizens versus United transformed utterly. So 
I'm really sad that Congress in the context of 1978, you say, Jimmy Carter, give it up. <laughs> but you don't say, you know, Tip O'Neill. And these are people who I think were, were, you know, great Americans. I'm sad that, you know, the Supreme Court and the U.S. Congress is not a part of this if we're really thinking about being a deliberative democracy. So what can what can the, the National Archives do to, um, and I think this is what you need in a democracy, to really lessen the hyper-partisanship? Because part of the problem with uh, our, our democracy right now is how, vi how, is how vituperative, um, you know, really all sides are, e even as I think the sides are not morally equal or equivalent, but but people are yelling. And you can see this outside of the court um, in Manhattan. There are people, it's, 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 a, it's a parade and a festival and a demonstration, and people are angry with each other and screaming and yelling. And in certain ways, it's exactly what the founders wanted to uh, prevent. Um, with with with, with uh, uh, the, the 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 division of government and power. So, what can the archive do? What can the archivists do in this context? Well, I think it's both do and not do. Um, first of all, the archivist of the United States has to be the most nonpartisan person you can imagine. You have to be clear that you are there to enforce the law, um, to protect records, no matter what. You have to deal with presidential families of both parties. You have to deal with both houses of Congress because you do get the legislative records of both houses of Congress and you get the records of the congressional committees. And so it doesn't matter. I was once chief of the legislative archives branch in the National Archives. And believe me, when uh, in that case, the Senate turned over for the first time from Democrats to Republicans, we got a lot of records. We got a lot of records coming down because the uh, interest was making sure they were in the archives and they were not in the hands of the incoming uh, party. So you have to be neutral and you have to show that you are neutral all the time. You have to go to um, events on in Republican places and Democratic places. And then you have to stay away from the fundraisers and the, the real partisan uh, events and make sure that it's clear that you're not going to those kinds of things. You're going to go to the funeral of the Republican president and the funeral of the Democratic president and on and on like that. The question is whether you can do more than that. And I think every time you start to step beyond that, you risk your, your nonpartisan uh, stage it's one of the reasons why putting exhibits together in the National Archives is such a challenge because you've got to get that balance right or people are going to be really unhappy and you're going to get a lot of uh, public criticism and, and that has happened certainly to the National Archives. But uh, beyond that, you've got to try to stay with the document as history and you have to say, as we always said, when we certified a document, this is a certified true copy of a document. We are not certifying the content of the document as true. This is truly a copy. It is an exact copy, but we are not certifying what the content is. So with that neutrality, sort of like the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> well, the Supreme Court is supposed to be. <laughs> so Nikki, has this ever happened before in terms of when we think about presidential records? Is there a context and we go, and I know, you know, we've been reminded in the 19th century, there is none, there is no, but have there been contestations before um, like this where people wanted to sort of get at uh, presidential uh, records and there were, there were, there was disagreements and sort of divides or are we in something really new and unprecedented? Oh, sure. I mean, this has been, as I mentioned in the introduction, a contentious area since the Presidential Records Act emerged, in part because, yes, it is it is vitally important and it has power, but as uh, Trudy was saying, the enforcement mechanism is a mess. And so when people are trying to access these papers or argue that certain papers should be included in the archive and not others, that's when there are all sorts of conflicts that crop up over who has kind of the responsibility for um, for the papers, who has control over the papers. There was actually this big um, dust up in the 1990s because um, President George H.W. Bush 
had worked out a deal with the archivist that would have conferred complete control of the presidential records with the president after he left office. Um, and I think it's the AHA that sues on behalf of kind of on behalf of the archive um, to make sure that 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 wasn't in the spirit of the Presidential Records Act. The Presidential Records Act was about um, creating a kind of oversight for the presidential records to make sure that uh, that they would be entered into a kind of public record and a public accessibility. Um, and, you know, Tim can tell you about the stories from the Nixon Library and the contest over um, what gets shared and what doesn't get shared. It's certainly conflicts between people who see themselves as legacy preservers and people who see themselves as history preservers. Um, those can sometimes look the same on the outside, but they are vastly different political projects. Um, and so those kinds of contestations appear kind of wherever there are presidential records or, or mm -hmm. arguments about, um, about government records, um, because there is so much invested in what's on the record, what gets held back. I mean, this is something we run into. I'm just finishing up the um, Obama presidency oral history project. And in oral history, um, you run into some of these same kinds of things. You only hear from official voices within the administration or do you widen it out? So you hear, um, you know, voices of protests um, and voices of criticism within an oral history. And so there are things that historians and archivists can do to kind of try to help round out the record. And I think organizations like the AHA have been involved for a long time in um, both litigating and uh, lobbying for access to more records and the organization and preservation of those records. Um, but this has absolutely been an area of contestation from the word go. And I think that it will continue to be just because so much is at stake. And Tr Trudy, yeah. so, you know, building on that, you have so much experience in terms of international archives. And I wanna ask you, how do we compare internationally, uh, both uh, where are we better, where are we worse? And is there some kind of international mm -hmm. model that you've seen that you think even as perfect as that model may be, we would be um, better off if we followed aspects of that model? Um, let me, uh, I'm happy to answer that, but let me add to uh, what Nikki just said. Um, and that is, uh, I woke up one morning as acting archivist of the United States to find myself being sued by the AHA of which I was a member. Um, this is, you know, a very strange situation. But the Archivist of the United States is indeed a member of the executive branch. And if the executive branch takes a position that you think is wrong and you have argued your way through as far as you can and the administration decides, no, that's not the way we're going to go, you are stuck. You either agree that you will follow the administration's line or you resign. There's, there's just no other two ways. And so uh, people like AHA, people like uh, all of our friends in other uh, organizations, the watchdog role is really important. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, AHA just won, I'm sorry, Pinal, I'll get back to your question, but AHA just helped win a wonderful victory, I think, for the archives. Uh, the archives was going to close for financial reasons, the uh, Seattle uh, Regional Archives Branch. And AHA joined with a large number of other people, especially people in the Pacific Northwest and got that stopped. And now we've seen in the budget request from the White House money to start the planning to build a new archives building in Seattle. Yes, that's the kind of thing that only outside forces looking at what's going on can do, and you're absolutely dependent upon them. Um, I would also say that outside forces have to look at uh, decisions that are being proposed for what to save and what to throw away. Those are public. They have to uh, be in the federal register for a set period of time before executing them. And only by having public comment is that ever changed. So sorry about that. Um, oh, no, no, it's great. Um, as to international, well, 
of course, you have the difference between the presidential and the prime ministerial um, uh, situations. One of the ones I'd point to you that's very interesting is uh, South Korea. Uh, I was there just before the pandemic and they have built a very large new building for presidential archives. And it's for all presidents it is going to be a presidential archives, not one president or another one. Now, it's so new, we don't know how that's going to work. But as you think about what is happening now with the Obama material, where he has decided he does not want to have the classic presidential library with the records in the uh, structure in Chicago, except for those which are not uh, classified, and then only in a copy, but the originals will stay with the National Archives. And of course, that's what it is with Trump right now. The Trump records are in the National Archives, not in a separate structure. Looking at this model out of South Korea starts to be a very interesting one. Would we be willing to fund a structure that would be archives of the presidency, not of the presidents? And that makes a lot of sense in historical terms, because things don't end with an administration. The National Security Council goes on, the issues go on. And in some ways, I think by having these uh, individual pods out there, we have shown a disjunction in the government that actually isn't true. And the history of our country goes across administrations, not separate. So it's an interesting model. I don't know how it's going to work and I don't know if it would work here. But what we're starting to see now with Obama and Trump, we have the records now in one location in Washington. We don't have them in presidential libraries or as they were technically called, presidential archival depositories. Can you imagine if we called them pads? But anyway. <laughs> So my, with the time that we have left, I, I want to talk about narrative and the narrative wars in these presidential um, records. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll start with Nikki and then and Tim can, can wrap us up. You know, both, both you think about Trump, Obama, even the vice presidents, um, Kamala Harris, Pence. Um, Nikki, discuss how uh, these records now and you've worked on the Obama Oral History Project, are so vital to shaping a narrative of a presidency, um, an argument about that president's relevance and why that, why that matters. Because there's so many people connected to presidents, including people who are gonna get future jobs, people who are gonna run for office themselves, they're gonna be part of private equity, hedge funds, they become presidents of universities, just all kinds of reasons. They become K Street lobbyists, they become global lobbyists, right? Um, talk to us about that and why these records matter. As somebody who, you know, I've, I've read John Meacham's brilliant book on Abraham Lincoln, I've read your work, I've read Tim's work, like whether you're talking about Richard Nixon or, or presidents from the 19th, 18th century, we're constantly shifting the legacy. One year, Nixon's up, and the other, he's down. One year, we reevaluate Eisenhower and say, <laughs> maybe he was a great statesman. Um, in another year, we say that Bill Clinton was magnificent or he was a disappointment. You know, sometimes we say Kennedy was an unfinished presidency. Uh, but Fred Logeval is showing us in two volumes, he's this extraordinary figure in a way that I, I hadn't really seen before, right? So why does it, and by the time we have Madam President, her, uh, uh, legacy is going to be contested too, you know? So tell us about the records and this narrative war, the stories these records are trying to tell. Yeah, I mean, I think that the important thing is that the records don't necessarily tell a story. It's um, what we bring to the records and the stories that we pull out of them um, that really matter, right? That's why we see the narrative shifting. And even if we had a sort of perfect documentary record of a presidency, we would still continue to battle over what that presidency meant. Um, and those records though help us, they help us to understand the presidency is more than a president. I think you can't spend very much time in presidential records or presidential oral histories without realizing that the presidency is kind of this giant governmental corporation 
full of hundreds, if not thousands of people making decisions, putting decisions into effect. Um, and you get an appreciation, not just for you know, the mind and the decision-making of the person who sits in the big seat, um, but the entire flow of people working around them um, and both their extraordinariness and their ordinariness. Um, I think that's the thing that I'm struck by during presidential oral histories is talking to all of these people who've been running the country and you're both so awed by all that they've done, but you're also like, wow, you're not that different from me. Um, and I think that's <laughs> something kind of amazing about that, um, to know that our country, as um, scary as it is at times, is run by citizens, um, which feels like an important thing to remember. And I think that presidential records can really help us appreciate and understand that. Um, of course, they don't exist in a vacuum. Um, and the challenge, and I, the historians and archivists know, but I think that it's worth um, restating, is that an archive is only as complete as the documents that are in it. And there are all kinds of voices that are missing. There are all sorts of silences. There are records that have been destroyed um, or records that remain classified or that were never turned over um, that leave gaps and absences in presidential records. And so we have to find a million different ways to fill those in, um, not just by you know, talking to other members of the administration through an oral history, but talking to ordinary people and talking to activists and trying to understand all of the perspectives outside of a presidency, as well as all of those inside of a presidency. So, I mean, the, the Presidential Records Act gives us that good first chunk. Um, and then from there, it's um, kind of everybody's game once they start pawing through those papers to figure out, you know, what do you think the story of this presidency is and how do you make your case um, for all of those different narratives? Great, thank you. And now, Tim, in terms of, I want you to, you know, that question, but amplified in a certain way, because you mentioned at the start of this webinar, the imperial presidency. And, and, you know, sometimes people have talked about Richard Nixon as an imperial president, uh, Ronald Reagan as an imperial president. Um, uh, you know, certainly, um, depending on your perspective, you can see somebody like Barack Obama or Trump as imperial presidents when you think about uh, some people's version of, of Obamacare, um, uh, drone strikes, uh, certain things that, that uh, President Trump did as well. When we think about these narratives in the Presidential Records Act, how and why is this so important to the public? Because, you know, we, we talk about the public and Nikki was mentioning the, the, the presidency and why it's so important. There's a whole cottage industry of people loving John Adams and George Washington <laughs> and Thomas Jefferson and, 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 and Theodore Roosevelt and looking at them as real, we hate to say it because we're in a democratic republic, but as some, some kind of kings, monarchs, these, these, sort of, these sort of heroic figures and sometimes we even do it with, you know, Dolly Madison and we do it with first ladies. There's an extraordinary, Julia Zweig has an extraordinary book on Lady Bird Johnson, brilliant book. And so what, how are these records shaping that? And are there, are there opportunities as well as challenges? Because the president is also a reflection of our democracy and our democratic ethos and virtues at its best, at its best, right? I remember when Obama won on election night, he said that his victory was proof that America was a place where all things are possible, right? That's a kind of progressive American exceptionalism, even as that's a kind of um, contradiction, right? Uh, in terms of American exceptionalism. So what can the records do in terms of that public narrative? Because regular citizens are always obsessed with the president, whether it's their president, their favorite is elected or not. Well, first of all, um, I think that uh, this is an empowering moment for undergraduates and graduate students. Uh, I'm not talking about the job market, which is a whole different discussion. It's a very sad story. But in terms of knowledge, because more materials are being digitized, there's more that is accessible on the web, therefore. And because uh, for lots of reasons, uh, political historians have a lot of questions they're asking. But there are also questions that are not being asked as much. So there's a great room for um, changing the narrative of presidents uh, by people that might not necessarily be professors anywhere. So it's a great time to be interested in American history because the documents, 
are overwhelming in number. And the number of people working on them professionally is not that large. So this is a great time to be asking big questions about presidents. What, in, what are the challenges? There are big challenges, but they're exciting challenges. You just have to think about, the first thing is you think about how were records created by the presidency you've, you've chosen. And think of it as an organism, trying to figure out how it documented something. And then anticipate what might what record might exist and then go for it, look for it. It's a treasure hunt. It's an exciting treasure hunt. I'm, I'm writing a, a presidential biography of John F. Kennedy, where I'm going to describe how the legacy was shaped by the destruction of materials or the removal of materials, and by the way in which the, the Kennedy um, legacy business um, edited things out of documents, edited out of uh, manuscripts. Uh, the Kennedy legacy is the product of a very um, uh, determined, concentrated effort at creating a certain uh, legacy for, for this man who was brutally murdered. I would say that dealing with the legacy of someone who was taken from us in a way as graphic and ugly as was the case in Dallas in 1963 made it a real challenge to be um, balanced about that person's legacy. But it, it because of the, the the pain of the family, it became even more difficult for, for historians to actually get at the real truth of John F. Kennedy, which is a real challenge. Um, Nixon. Nixon's people tried really hard to destroy documents and they destroyed a lot. Fortunately, they didn't destroy everything. And one place where I would disagree a little, I wouldn't disagree with Trudy because she was saying it's an opportunity. I would disagree with the South Korean model is that one of the reasons, one of the ways we find out things about presidents is that we have expert archivists who know the records. And when you combine all records into one place, Unless you have money for a lot of staffing and the way our government works, you are generally underfunded for such things. What happens is people don't know the records anymore. And so things don't get lost. Nothing gets lost, but they don't get found. And you and unfortunately, because the cost, even the cost of coming to DC is expensive, uh, Arca, uh, unless you digitize everything, uh, scholars don't have the chance to find it. And so things don't, they get overlooked and they don't get put into the declassification system because things are not put into the declassification system automatically. It's one of the misunderstandings of how our declassification system works here. Things are reviewed um, by a certain timetable, but then if they're found to be properly classified, you have to actually ask for that document. So pulling all our records together into one place, I think would be a disaster for presidential records. And we've seen the problem already. Uh, one place where historians, the HA, can be more vocal is in asking questions of the National Archives about its declassification system at the moment. It's underfunded, understaffed, and it has now the Obama records, the Trump records, and the classified materials of a number of, form of presidents from an earlier era, and they don't have the staff to take care of it. One of the sad consequences of President Obama's decision is that his records don't have the archival resources available that they would have had if he had accepted an ordinary presidential library in Chicago. So and one of the unintended consequences of the Barack Obama model, I fear, unless Congress gives more money to the National Archives, which I want to see happen, is that Obama records will be less accessible over time than the records of, for example, Richard Nixon, or Ronald Reagan. Thank you. Well, we're gonna end and wind up here. I'm gonna give it over to Jackie Price Osafo, who's the Executive Director of the Society of American Archivists. Thank you to our panelists, all of you. Brilliant. Thank you, Peniel. And thank you once again to our panelists, Trudy, Tim, and Nikki. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experience. I think you know, Peniel, you, sum, you basically summed it up towards the very end. Why is, is this important to us? It is important to us as American people for the protection of our history, democracy, and our civil liberties. It is just that simple. It is just that simple that um, it is necessary that we have this protection so that we preserve our history. So once again, thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. We appreciate it. And have a